All right, we are going to start up on our first panel of the day, and we have a couple. And we go from, we go from what was really an inspiring, but also a very clear and I think uh, crisp, crisp set of instructions about how we all have to act to delving into some specific topics in much greater depth. And this is one, the first panel today is one where I think this topic has gotten way too little attention. Actually, you could argue much of the public health effects of climate change have gotten way too little attention. Um, but the issues around migration, um, displacement, and the health effects of those things, the political effects of those things are massive. And I think we've been thinking a lot about that uh, and seeing it politically. But the health effects are also quite substantial. And I'm not going to spend too much time introducing the panel. Actually, I'll have our, our moderator, Bonnie Doherty, from uh, the law school, um, who is a, a senior instructor in the International Human Rights Clinic, uh, who's going to be our moderator and guide for the day. I'll, I'll let her introduce the panel. But um, uh, I think this is a topic that, that needs a lot more attention uh, because it will become a bigger and bigger issue over time. So I'll turn it over to you, Bonnie. Thank you for moderating this panel. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, we have a tough act to follow after Gina McCarthy, but I'm sure the panel is up to it. And we're also, I think, the whole audience is quite awake after that inspiring speech. So uh, looking forward to hearing what we have to say. Um, is I, I'm a little bit of an outsider being from the law school as opposed to a scientist. But I'm excited to see how the uh, public health world relates to some topic I've been working on, which is climate migration, as well as climate change more broadly. So. Uh, the, as you know, the topic of this particular panel is climate change, migration, and health. And in the interest of time, I'll dive right into introductions and give our panelists the maximum amount of time so we can also have time for questions at the end. To introduce them in the order that they are speaking, we, I have Michael Van Royen, director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative at Harvard University, as well as chairman of emergency medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is also professor at the medical school and the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Michael has significant field experience, having worked as an emergency physician with numerous relief organizations in over 30 countries affected by war and disaster, many of which have also been affected by climate change. Uh, Michael has also served as a relief expert for several non-governmental organizations, as well as policy advisor to international organizations. Jennifer Leaning, on the far left, is director of the XFB Center at Harvard University and is FXB Professor of Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health, as well as Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Jennifer's extensive experience in public health rights-based responses to humanitarian crises, and she formerly served as the co-director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and director of the Program on Humanitarian Crises and Human Rights at the FXB Center. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer has also served on the boards of several NGOs and worked in medical management and clinical work in emergency medicine. Finally, uh, Kira Vinka is a research analysis to the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And she was previously analyst to the director for the German Advisory Council on Global Change to the federal government. She has done extensive field research, for example, she, looking at the link between public health and migration and climate change in Burkina Faso. And she's done research on the nexus between climate change and migration to vulnerable cities in southern Bangladesh, and as well as served in the capacity as a consultant with the German Development Corporation. For the past year, she has also served as an external consultant for the Asian Development Bank. So without further ado, I will send it over to Michael uh, to get us started. Can I hit the yes, and there are the PowerPoints up there. Excellent. Just click to, yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to serve on a panel with my esteemed panelists. And thank you, uh, Bonnie and Dashish, in particular, for the invitation. Um, so this could occupy a, a big span of, of activity and space to talk about the health implications of, of climate change. And so I'm going to focus on a couple areas because um, uh, you, know, you just have to focus on a couple areas. And I'll, I'll kind of, in my 15 minutes, I'll probably spend five minutes in each of these topics. And then maybe we can have a few questions afterwards. The first is um, 
briefly about the, the sort of how you think about climate change and health impacts, um, particularly categorically and also in sort of a larger sense in direct health impacts versus direct indirect health impacts. I want to talk a little bit about natural disasters because that's a, in, in my field, in the humanitarian field, I'll focus specifically on natural uh, disasters and humanitarian emergencies, uh, war-related emergencies, and Jennifer will follow up with, a, with I think, a really interesting discussion uh, on, a, on a particular case. Um, so the National Institute of Environmental Health issued a report in 2010 that tells us probably what we all know and can surmise, and none of this is particularly surprising, and that is that um, there's major sort of features and attributes of global warming and climate change take place in terms of looking at uh, levels of precipitation, extreme weather events, um, droughts leading to food insecurity and famine um, on the sort of precipitation end, on the warming ends or sea level rise, heat waves, crop destruction, and, and kind of air quality changes. And, and then the adapted behaviors, or at least the forced behaviors of things like human migration, economic vulnerability, um, and really the, the, the force of conflict and the way that, that climate change can force states um, into conflict. Um, again, all of these are hugely broad topics. I'm going to talk about just specifically um, some of the health implications by using this kind of um, table. Um, they are legion, and uh, what I'd rather focus on is just a couple areas and maybe a little case, not a case, but an example. Um, certainly there's sort of direct effects of climate change for populations that face um, you know, sea level rise, et cetera. Um, the big one I wanna talk about are the one in the sort of bottom left, enforced migration conflict, and how communities are forced on top of each other, particularly uh, pastoralist communities on top of agrarian communities such that they compete for resources because that's a real threat and a real problem that we see play out in places like Darf Darfur, which I'll talk about. Um, the other one is things like food supply and food conflict and the sort of changes in food um, availability based on climate issues. And finally, at the upper right, the issue of um, changing habitats for vectors such as uh, um, mosquitoes in particular and the changing uh, climates where um, malaria can change in its uh, exposure and um, the epidemiology of malaria, of dengue, and of other uh, important diseases um, changes. And the example of this is important actually because um, I'll just as a parenthetical, about uh, four years ago, HHI hosted a climate and crisis seminar where we brought climate change scientists together to talk about big climate issues, and we talked humanitarian experts to, with them to talk about humanitarian issues. Climate scientists talk about things in 50-year increments, and humanitarians talk about things in like 50-hour increments or something. So they're talking about highly reactive issues, whereas climate scientists are talking about long-term projections, and it was a very interesting mismatch. The, the conference was like that, because the climate scientists really were uncomfortable talking about anything that really was within the next 20 years even. So, um, and beyond that, the humanitarians can't even think about that stuff. So, um, but one thing that we can agree on is that the habitat changes of certain uh, vectors are really important. And so we see uh, both the extension of malaria endemic regions and dengue, for example, being probably one of the most or the most prominent now mosquito-borne illness, as well as emerging threats like you know Zika, for example, or um, other sort of virus uh, um, mosquito-borne illnesses that really will change because of population movement, because of migration, and largely actually just because of habitat change. Um, so. On the health side, there are many things to talk about on the health side, and probably we can catch some of those when we have questions. The second part of that is actually um, natural disasters and sort of uh, calamities that have to do with uh, um, really hydrological effects. So um, this is on top of each other. Sorry about that. But the, um, the, there's well-known data that show that natural disasters are increasing in frequency, they're increasing in intensity, they're increasing in economic impact, they're increasing in the, the sort of socioeconomics and population migration and pushing people on top of each other. Um, you know, to say 80% of this growth is due to climate change is, is one of the statistics that I'll show you in a few minutes that you'll argue with right out, out of the gate and you'll be right. Nobody knows that. But we do know that populations that are coastal and populations that are subject to climate issues um, are increasingly vulnerable, and there's a lot of issues that relate to population migration, population vulnerability because of natural disasters. So, I mean, what do we expect in the future when we think about the, the nature of climate change and the effect on, on human health? 
Um, so one is that we're going to see more extreme des disaster extremes. Everybody believes it. We see it, whether it's Hurricane Sandy or we see it in uh, uh, typhoons in the Philippines. We'll see more and greater and more intense weather events that lead to population displacement, economic disruption, and changes in human health. Um, we will see water scarcity in some places. So while we'll have a predominance of water-related emergencies such as floods in one place, of course, we'll see whether it's the desertification of the Sahara or other places that will simply force populations off that area of land and force them south or north. Um, that it causes competition for resources and eventually migration. And the, this insecurity that this panel is going to talk about that migration brings is significant. And so the competition over resources and simply the inhospitable nature of some places in the earth to live will mean that people have to migrate on top of each other, which forces conflict, which is the major part of what I like to talk about generally as it relates to HHI, because a lot of what our work is is to look at the precipitants of conflict and how to deal with the human health com complica complications of conflict. Now, those are direct, of course, but the, the greater complications of conflict are deprivation of resources, undermining healthcare systems, not availability of qualified people, and just economic destruction. Um, so the climate sort of tensions really happen for a, a variety of kind of easy to think about reasons, right? Climate change erodes livelihoods in a very tangible way. People can't farm. They can't produce crops. They can't, the markets won't support them. They eventually have to move. And those communities either move from coastal areas that are under th sort of disaster threat or have been, um, or they have to move away from arid zones, right? That places this, again, pastoralism in competition with agrarian communities. Um, it exacerbates ethnic tensions, and Darfur, again, is a great example of that, and creates conditions of, of sort of famine. Now, we all know, or maybe you, you don't know, that famine doesn't happen um, in the absence of war, or almost typically, it almost never happens in the absence of war. So in other words, the only reason famine happens is because not only is there destruction of production, and there's destruction of the economy of food but there's and migration of people, but also there's no ability to distribute because of insecurity. So the famine that we see, we have see a, an epic famine, actually, the worst since the formation of the UN is occurring today. And we hear about Syria a lot, but we don't hear about the famine that is occurring in Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, and Sudan, South Sudan. Um, it's affecting 25 million people um, that have food dependency, um, and it's the biggest famine that we'll see. And if um, we can't organize to, to react, we'll see um, uh, tr tremendous uh, um, mortality rates. Um, this also, this migration lends to then urbanization and expansion of urban poor, which gives another sort of health implication as well. So um, speaking of Potsdam, actually, there, I'm going to give you, and I'm not, don't read this. I'm just going to actually highlight a couple little pieces of data, and then I'll finish. Um, that... Uh, a, a, a number of panels and a number of scientific inquiries have looked at the, the, the contribution that conflict, um, or that, that environment makes to conflict, the precipitation of conflict. And there's a number of studies that um, note that um, climate change will exacerbate ethnic tensions, particularly in ethnically divided areas that have vulnerability. And so we will see escalation of ethnic tensions that will lead again to migration, but also to conflict. Um, Jennifer's example is going to be a good one. Darfur is an excellent example of, as well. To blame the war in Darfur on climate is, would be not correct, but uh, climate as an exacerbating condition where populations are forced on top of each other, creating crisis and creating conflict, that then it gets exacerbated by a, 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 a government such as uh, uh, in Khartoum, um, really then can exacerbate crisis. Um, and the issue of water wars, I mean, the, the fact is that um, desertification and also climate stressors on the other side, um, in terms of excess water and disasters, um, will create and exacerbate existing ten tensions. Now, to say that there'll be a 54% increase in armed conflict, like some panels might, I don't know if you can go there. And so I was going to say to Richard Cash, who will certainly be a naysayer, who's sitting in the back of the room, you don't have to say that this is false. I'm sure it's going to be false. But the point of, of this is really that, oops, sorry, is that the, the military and our U.S. government's military looking at their quadrennial strategy and beyond is pretty concerned about this stuff as the, the idea that climate can really and climate change can and may precipitate global conflict in a way that we have not seen. So instead of conflict being over 
you know, land or territory or power or whatever it's going to be over resources. Um, it's not something that we can ignore. Um, so however hyperbolic some of the data may be as it relates to the effect of climate on conflict and on human health, there are things that we do that, are that we know that are common sense. It tells us that, again, sorry, these are squished, but um, we know that there's going to be threats to livelihoods. We know that drought will increase. We know that food scarcity will increase. We know that food prices will increase. We know that migration will increase. And we know that there's going to be comp competition, competition for natural resources. We know that economic stress will be significantly in areas that are already insecure, driving populations to conf be in conflict with each other, particularly in areas that have significant ethnic tensions already. Um, and we know that both population movements, urbanization, and conflict that results of climate change will have profound impacts on human health. It'll have profound impacts on the way that sort of people access health, get health care, and even just have the, the ability and the economies to support health care. Um, so in summary, I, I didn't get into details about which diseases were going to get worse. I think that would be an endless discussion, and it would all be still speculation. Um, what I wanted to do is just highlight kind of those three things, that there are direct consequences of climate change on the habitats of, say, mosquitoes and on the availability of resources and the availability of food. Um, there are direct effects of natural disasters that are going to cause populations to have to adapt and move, likely to urbanize, which will create another problem. And in particular, and most, I think, uh, um, ominous perhaps, is the uh, competition for resources and, and the conflict that can ensue in, um, in ethnically divided countries that can lead to an escalation in conflict that we'll have to deal with. So that, with that rosy note, um, I'll turn it over to Jennifer to, to speak for a moment as well, and then I'll look forward to having a few questions. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Good afternoon, or good morning. Uh, it feels actually as if I've <clears throat> been deeply involved in uh, what Gina McCarthy has been telling us. And that was an exuberantly wonderful speech, but also exhausting when. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so good morning. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you very much, Ashish, and uh, um, a School of Public Health and Harvard University Center for the Environment and a number of other uh, groups that are um, here sponsoring this. And I um, appreciate being on this panel. Uh, I'm going to be talking, despite this um, very long title, Climate Change, Distress Migration, and Armed Conflict, I will be focusing on the case of Syria. And I would just like to acknowledge that Jim McCarthy is in this room. He and I have spent years teaching a course at Harvard for undergraduates on um, environment, uh, forced migration, and war. And about four or five years ago, <clears throat> I said to the Hughes Steering Committee, Harvard University Center on the Environment, that um, I, uh, I thought we needed to really build up the climate change argument because it was becoming increasingly clear that it wasn't just environmental degradation. It was climate change that we really had to incorporate. And uh, Jim stepped up and um, is the main climate change expert uh, that we relied upon for this analysis and much of what I've learned about climate change has come from him. So it's great to see you here, and, and thank you for being here. Uh, the um, point I'd like to make in this is, first of all, distress migration as a definition. In the last three years, you're going to be seeing this term, and progressively now it will be a much more prominent term in um, UN, NGO, social science discussions, because we have bundled together a vast strain of names for migration that actually are turning out to be much more overlapping and coherent than we had um, acknowledged in the past. So it's covering what we used to call forced migration, which is, was often um, a followed war, involuntary migration, where for a number of reasons people moved. They were forced, but it wasn't quite clear what was forcing them. It may not have been conflict. Economic migration, which was used disdainfully for people who wanted to get a better life, and then we realized that most of the people who wanted to get a better life were coming from desperate circumstances. Um, refugees, which has a classic international law definition, and internally displaced peoples who um, 
in the last 15 years have been grudgingly acknowledged as forced migrants of a different kind. They're trapped. Uh, and if you put that combination of people together, recognizing that the force that is propelling them to move or the force that has propelled them to move within a country and not get out um, is um, almost overwhelmingly the contributors to their desperation, then you get into climate change and you have to think about how war intersects with these issues. So distressed migrants are going to be the populations that we have to look for as changing our world. And I'm including this country because the countries that are not under this amount of stress that we see from many other parts of the world, the countries that are actually still moderately stable are going to have to step up significantly in both preventive and response modes. And if that is not a public health paradigm, there um, I would challenge you to present another one. So from a very, very profound sense, uh, what we're facing with distress migration is a public health problem. It's a huge problem of human misery as well, and to some extent human adaptation. I put here the definition of refugees from the Refugee Convention of 1951 and the 67 Protocol just to let you see how restrictive it is. <clears throat> this is a person who, quote, owing to well-founded fear of well-founded means document it. You can't just assert it. You can't talk to a migration officer or a border person. You have to have letters, show newspapers, emails of threats. You have to be able to say, my son was in prison, and here's a photo <laughs> of him as he was being apprehended. You have to be able to prove that your fear is well-founded. Secondly, you have to prove that you're being persecuted, which is a very powerful word in English. Um, it's got a biblical connotation. It is the persecution of infidels, persecution of evil people. Persecution is intense scrutiny and pursuit of a person for who he is or what he stands for. And then you get to these following categories, race, which includes um, ethnicities of various kinds, religion, other sectarian issues, nationality, which is another way of parsing people, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, that is broad and expansive. Um, and then fundamentally, you can't even make this argument until you're outside your country of nationality. So that makes internally displaced people not part of the refugee convention. By definition, they're not outside. Over the last 25 years, thanks to very good work being done out of the Brookings Institution and other um, major NGOs, the notion of an IDP has come under guiding principles, but it's still not international law. How one treats them, takes care of them, handles them um, in their distress mode. Refugees and IDPs together have now, um, in the last 10 years, become more numerous than whatever ravaged populations we counted after World War II in Europe. This is World War II in Europe alone. 50 million stateless, wandering around, homes had disappeared, refugees, IDPs, couldn't go back. We didn't have the categories then. But there were 50 million people in Europe alone that needed to find a new home. And we had thought that was the high water point. And you can see that in the last 10, 15 years, that has been exceeded. And this graph is even out of date, 60 million as of 2015, it's now upwards of 67 to 68 million and rising. So this issue of who is fleeing, um, and this counts just refugees in that narrow category and IDPs. It doesn't count the distressed migrants. Um, you can see that we are in a, a calamitous position that we've not seen in the lifetime of, of many of us. Climate change and conflict are deeply interrelated, and this is how I think one should deal with the arguments that say we are overreaching. Climate change creates very unstable conditions, forcing populations to move because of the collapse of livelihoods um, or threats to their peace and, and security, as Mike has outlined. Conflict arises when one population moves into the land, um, the space, and the culture of another population. Um, so this relationship is driven between climate change and conflict is driven by distress migration. That's why you all have to understand it. It's people who are moving who don't want to be moving. And the relationship is mediated by good governance. I mean, India is very stressed. 
you have a lot of economic migration. It's going to be very much affected by climate change and already is. You're not seeing wars break out. India, for all of its um, peculiar governance, <laughs> is actually well governed at many of the more local levels and at some of the state levels and is paying attention to these issues because ethnic conflict is something they're very well aware of, sectarian and communal conflict. And so the good governance, even in countries that are at pretty high risk, can moderate the risk of actual outbreak of conflict. But when you have a collapse of good governance or you've never had it to begin with in the lifetimes of several generations, this is where you are at risk for distress migration leading to um, actual outbreak of armed conflict. And unfortunately, many parts of the world have uh, a paucity and a deficit in governance. The case of Syria is one in point. So one can look at this as a form of climate change and distress migration. You could also look at Syria as a form of failed early warning of the precipitance of, of conflict. And I'm proposing that as we think about the world now, we should look at uh, pronounced climate change affecting livelihoods of a part of a population in a country that has bad governance and sectarian communal conflict history. Okay, risk factors. Bad government, sectarian um, violence in the past, intentions that are rising. Climate change is hitting that part of a country. That is an early warning for significant armed conflict. And we lost that opportunity in Syria. So a very, very bad drought began to descend on northern Syria, northern eastern region of Syria in 2006. The government of Syria in 2009 issued a report. The World Food Program issued a report. The brittle government of Hafez al-Assad told the northern Sunni population to double down on more irrigation, planting more wheat. Wheat is quite water uh, consumptive uh, crop. They knew that was the wrong idea. It was an autocratic government. They obeyed the orders. Drought got worse. Crops failed more extensively. And in terms of the climate change that was involved, it was not just the decreased rainfall. It was the increasing heat. This is a very powerful element of climate change that we are underestimating, and it's just beginning to be explored by the climate scientists. It's the oppressive heat which can dry out the soil. And predictions are that by the mid-century, uh, 2050-ish, on the higher levels of the production, uh, pred predictions of Carmen uh, forcing, uh, we were going to be experiencing heat in the North Africa and MENA region that can dry out the soil down eight inches so that it is like um, sand. It has no biome. It has no organic material. Doesn't matter what you produce in terms of seeds or what water you deliver, it will not grow crops. And this is one of the threats that is happening to much of our world, a heavily populated part of our world, and we're first seeing it start in Syria. And the crop failures, government um, policies, the Alawite government of Hafez al-Assad was not pro-Sunni, to put it mildly. And so there was no support. In fact, there was negative um, action. This is a map. Um, the brown is actually appropriate because this is a very drought prone and increasingly at risk um, part of the world. I ask you to notice, um, let's see if this clipper works. Um, I'd like you to notice up here, you see the Euphrates River coming down from Turkey, going into this part of northern Syria. The Euphrates River has been dammed um, with tremendous amount of controversy. Turkey upriver, Syria downriver, uh, and there's been a progressive loss of water in the Euphrates um, basin, but it's also due to bad farming practices in this northern area. Um, and you can see this map outlines where we are going to have um, to understand the world very, 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 very intensely. Everybody needs to know this geography. This is where this war is going and is conducted, and it's where the refugees are going, and it's where we're going to have to live with the consequences of an unremarked war for decades. Population grows precipitously in the last decades. The river, as you see, the downward um, slope, particularly after about 1990, this only goes to 2010, the amount of water that the Euphrates is delivering to this farmland has decreased dramatically from overuse and from the dams and from the drought. 
And this area called Hasaki, it's outlined in blue, is the predominantly dense Sunni area. And this is the map by the World Food Program that you saw that in July 20, um, 2009 pointed out that in this Hasaki area, the dark red extreme drought was not acted on. Um, the other crop besides wheat and subsistence farming um, are sheep. Um, sheep uh, couldn't find grass. They're sent to market. This is a pattern you see in early famine throughout the world. Crops fail. People sell off their animal crops. Million Sunnis go to the green part of Syria, which is the Alawite western part of Syria. And they go to the towns in the southern and eastern and the western portion of, of um, Syria, and they collide with a hostile Alawite population that are already there and well established, thank you very much. And the cities are already stressed by one and a half million Iraqi refugees who have fled the Iraq war and are in these cities. It's already overcrowded. And migration um, then to the cities led to demonstrations with the fact that the Sunnis were not welcomed. Civil war broke out in 2012 and you started seeing distressed migration out of the area in 2013. This is 2013 Syrian refugees crossing into Turkey. Uh, this is the early days of the out-migration. It looks as if many people are going here for a picnic. This is now a totally eroded, dusty, um, damaged-looking border, and uh, it has been a site of tremendous out-migration in Turkey. Um, this is, these are the kinds of wars that the people are fleeing. This is in western Syria, um, and you can see um, this sort of there are many tragedies in this photograph. I just bring it to evoke what the war is for the civilians who are in these besieged areas. Then we know the traffic, uh, tragic consequences of the flight from Turkey to Greece. Um, and this gives you the picture now. This is as of 2017. And what you basically have is over half of the population of Syria, estimated at 20, 21 million, um, uh, either out of the country or internally displaced. 13 and a half million people internally displaced upwards of five million or more refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, and many of them going north to Europe. There's a very, very well-known um, Syrian dissident in Istanbul who's just come out of, with a book about the war, and his way of framing it is <clears throat> now, um, all the world is in Syria, meaning the warring parties, and Syrians are nowhere, meaning that the country is destroyed. And I've framed it somewhat to say, all the world is in Syria, and Syrians are everywhere. But the country of Syria is irrevocably changed. And at least in the short run, the rest of our century, damaged. So we have about 450 to 500,000 deaths. Can't get in there to count. Many, very, many, many um, people. NGOs and very, very interesting public health and physician communities are counting. The injuries are absolutely unknown, but the burden of war in terms of amputations, brain injuries, multiple surgeries, bad burns, psychological trauma is there um, out in the refugee community, but also then trapped within Syria. This is a huge public crisis um, awaiting us. Um, they're living it. When we can get in, we can presumably begin to wrap and bind, but we will not be able to undo what has happened. So the case of Syria is from early warning to catastrophe. It has spurred the collapse of the international humanitarian and security architecture. There's no, um, this is not an overstatement. And it signals what lies ahead, which is the point that I would be making. This kind of war, unremarked in the early phases, is going to be repeated if we're not paying attention. This is the MENA estimate for the Mideast and North Africa that I was talking about, excellent study that came out from the climate scientists um, a year ago. And basically they said in the highlighted yellow, it's some of the stronger language you've seen from the climate scientists about human impacts, that this is going to anticipate increasing migration and political desperation, exacerbate humanitarian hardship and contribute to migration. This is, this is a powerful language and we see it evoked in Syria. There are potential responses. I, I'm not saying that this is um, inevitable, um, but the responses are big. Um, we have to address climate change, one response. We have to help people stay home. They don't want to move. Majority of people want to stay home. 
They're moving because they have no choices. That means bolstering good governance and supporting economic adaptation at home. Intervening early to stop conflicts from progressing. We have the norms, the laws, the knowledge, the potential capacity. That's where the collapse of the humanitarian security and humanitarian system is so um, miserably evoked with this last uh, seven years of war. We need to open the doors of de destination states, and we need to increase humanitarian aid in all phases of migration and temporary settlement. Uh, there are enormous policy nuances and problems attached to each of these. Nothing of these bullets is easy, and they all, they all involve pretty grim trade-offs. But that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I want to talk about uh, migration as adaptation to climate change, question mark. And um, first of all, I want to start with a question. What causes a person to migrate? What are the general uh, reasons for migration? And how could climate impacts affect a decision to stay or migrate? So it is important to note, and we've already um, heard a little bit about it, that climate migration is a multi-causal phenomenon. So there are different drivers which lead to migration, such as social drivers, economic drivers, political drivers, and demographic drivers. And then climate change can impact many of these. So it can change the political situation, it can change the economic situation of a family. And then the individual decision-making process of a person, a group, or a family to move um, also is affected by intervening variables, such as, for example, even the, the possibility to migrate. Does the, does the family have enough financial resources to afford to go? And so we see that it is a very, very complex process, migration, and there are many reasons why people do migrate. And not only that, um, there's a discussion on climate migration and on climate migrants, whether they exist or not. And I've thought about it a lot, why the discussion um, has circled also in a way, why there's still this doubt, are they really climate migrants or are they not? And I see that um, there's also, bes besides this causality, uh, multi-causality, there's also a double break in causal chains. So if we look at climate change and migration, and if we divide climate change impacts into sudden impacts, such as storms, extreme weather events, and slow impacts, such as degradation of sea level rise, uh, we can see um, the following. Um, at a sudden impact, a storm, everybody moves at the same time. So it is very easy to link the migration to the event, to the storm. After a cyclone, everybody moves within three days. But it is very, very difficult scientifically to say that this particular storm was caused by climate change. Because in general, we just talk about there's an overall intensification of storms, there's a higher frequency of these very intense storms. But we cannot point that this storm was caused by climate change. With the slow impacts, it's a little bit different. Um, we can often link that there is a dr the drought has been worsened by the already happened rise in temperature. But everybody moves at a different point in time. So maybe um, over several years, the first poor person moves after maybe 10% of their crop has failed. Um, maybe the next family moves after one year um, when the entire crop has failed. Maybe the last family moves after the first child has died. So it's very, very difficult then to link the migration to the climate impact event. So there are these two breaks in causal chains and this is why it's very, very hard to prove that this or that person is a climate migrant. However, this does not mean that these people do not exist, because they do, and they are suffering. So we learned that there's no legal definition of an environmental or climate migrant, but there are uh, working definitions, and this is the one of the International Organization for Migration. 
So they say that environmental migrants are persons or groups of persons who, for compelling reasons of sudden or progressive changes in the environment that adversely affect their lives or living conditions, are obliged to leave their habitual homes or choose to do so, either temporarily or permanently, and who move either within their country or abroad. So this is a very broad definition and sort of shows the variety um, of migration, migration movements that can be uh, related to the environment and also can be related to climatic events and to climate change. So I want to talk about one specific case, which is the case of Bangladesh, and to talk about uh, internal migration in Bangladesh. So here you can see some first pictures, but um, let me take you to um, the um, map of Bangladesh. This is Bangladesh, and um, the research I did was in the southern part of the country, where it says Bay of Bengal, so please focus on this region. So this is a map of the relative food insecurity of the country. So you can see that in the south of Bangladesh, um, by the colors dark blue and light blue, um, the relative food insecurity is very high. And this area is also affected by severe flooding risks. So you can see again the dark and a little bit lighter blue color indicates that there are moderate flash floods risks and also risks from uh, severe tidal surges. And then again, you can see that the south of Bangladesh is very much affected by cyclone risks. So there are high risks in the Shundarbans. This is the uh, region of forest right in the Bay of Bengal. And then it uh, goes inland, um, the wind risks um, extend to a large part of the country. And what's significant here is that these risks are going to extend further and further inland because as sea level rises, the storm surges that occur when a cyclone hits actually are much, much higher. They sort of build exponentially on the, uh, on the elevated sea level. So this is Cyclone Isla in 2009. And please look at the eye of the cyclone. This is the exactly area that I was just pointing towards where all these risks accumulate. So here you can see that this cyclone really affected the communities there. It displaced many, many people died. And it had very, very, very uh, tough effects on Bangladesh. And only two years beforehand, there was a very significant cyclone, Sidr, uh, which was even stronger than Isla in the similar region. So you can see here, this is a typical coastal community. And um, as you can imagine, if there's a five meter storm surge, um, these houses won't withstand much uh, when they are located right on the embankments as is um, very common there. And this is further inland and um, this is in the dry season. So um, there's not much rain in that season, but if there's a cyclone now coming, um, you can see that there's uh, going to be even more flooding into these houses. So this is a, a very bad condition for the people who live there. Um, and it also means a high stress on their livelihoods. So what we did for the Asian Development Bank, and this is still in preparation, is we made these cytoons, as we say it, to explain to policymakers as a way of communicating our science um, what can happen due to climate change impacts. So these are um, possible migratory routes um, that are caused by uh, environmental change. So we, send, we can see here tropical storms and we can see sea level rise and riverbed, um, uh, riverbank erosion, as well as uh, decreases in the crop yield. Also salinization um, from the um, water that comes from the coastal areas with the salt water, uh, which then leads to a salinization of soils and uh, fresh water is a big problem, especially also for pregnant women. So what we see here is that the migration can be also cascadal. So from the rural communities that I just pointed out, people move to the next bigger city. So for example, Kulna, one city you can see on the map, about 1.5 million people there. Um, and then um, they take on, for example, uh, hard physical labor. Um, they're often illiterate people who move there from the rural areas. They only have skills in um, traditional agriculture. And then in these cities, there may be different people from the middle class who then decide to leave because there are all these uh, laborers coming in who are willing to work for much less than they are. So then the middle class may be moving to Dhaka, the capital. And then in Dhaka, the informal settlements may grow 
Um, and also maybe there's a competition between now these migrants from Kulna moving into Dhaka and maybe new university graduates from Dhaka. So maybe the university graduates from Dhaka will say, well, I will try my luck in India or in Europe or uh, in the United States. So the migration really goes from one place to another, like an overflowing uh, sort of movement. So this means that while the university graduate coming to Europe cannot be identified as a climate migrant, um, we have to be aware um, that it can be connected to climate change, the general global movements also. So when we look at the city slums, uh, as for example in Kulna, uh, we see that people are actually not escaping the risk of climate change because in the city slums, um, when people move there from the rural areas, um, they are also located in very vulnerable um, geographical regions. So we see that here um, there's a big problem with overcrowding and there's also water logging, um, that when uh, heavy rain is coming, um, immediately the water level is rising and the woman we're talking to there, they said they have problems with infections on their legs because they always have to wade through the water. Um, infectious diseases are very common, there's no sanitary facilities, um, so you can imagine if the water is this high uh, that everything just flows around and it's uh, a very bad condition. So what do these migrants do when they arrive in the city and how do they survive? This was one of the questions I addressed in my work for uh, GIZ there. And we talked to the migrants in these cities and um, so as I said, they don't have skills for the urban labor market so they have to go to strong physical labor. So they work in rice mills, which is what you see in the picture here, and they work in brick factories and they work as cycle rickshaw drivers, for example. However, these are jobs that can only be done when it doesn't rain, because as you can see, the rice is drying out there. And the brick factories, you also dry the bricks in the rain, uh, in, the, in the sunshine. <laughs> so when it rains, um, uh, these people are out of work. And um, at this time, they often fall into the debt with the owner of this rice mill, for example. And the person we're talking to in this picture, she was telling us that the owner of the rice mill had taken her identity card that she could not leave then uh, the place that um, they were being uh, working for for the last years. So even after many, many years, we were there five years after the Cyclone Isla hit, people were still uh, in these slums and they still could not move um, because they had been uh, fallen into debt um, or they didn't have financial resources to go back to. All their land was submerged in the place they came from and they could not return. So just to give you some uh, impressions from um, the interviews we did, so we asked them first, why have you come here? So they said, only to save our lives. We did not have anything, no clothes, no house. We came to Kulna with one single set of wet clothes and barefooted. All three days of our journey to Kulna, we wore that single wet cloth. We are not exaggerating. This is what we have experienced and saw. We are just telling about that. And then we asked another person, she was actually uh, 15 uh, years old, we talked to her and the family she was staying with. She just said, everyone has died. So everyone I knew died, so I came here. And then we asked about, so how, how, how do you work here? Um, and then one person said, at first my husband came here for work, but when Cedar, this other cyclone, occurred and our house was totally damaged, we all shifted here permanently. And how do they do in Kulna? We live by hands to mouth. Here we are not happy either. The village has a tranquil environment, whereas the town is quite crowded. As we live in a rented house, I cannot provide my children a proper education. It's too expensive. And then we asked again, how are you doing? We can only survive here. We were better in the village when we had our own land. Now we are like beggars. So this shows, uh, I mean, these are just a few of the interviews that, that we took, but it shows that the situation of the migrants in these city slums is very dire um, and they would rather go back and they would have rather stayed in the first place. So as you said, um, most people want to stay. So how is this all connected uh, to health and I won't go into the details of this because you're probably more familiar with this image than I am. Um, this is uh, from the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change. And here uh, is the mobility and uh, conflict status as one of the social dynamics um, which then sort of mediate the direct and indirect defects um, which climate change has on the health impact. 
So if we look into the future, this is something we wrote for the German Advisory Council on Global Change, and we handed this to the German government, to the chancellor and to the um, different ministries. So we looked at what is uh, the responsibility for climate migrants. We made a thought experiment. So we looked at the German share of the overall CO2 budget under the two degree guardrail. So you have an emissions budget, if you know two degrees, you want to keep it, you know how much you can release into the atmosphere. And the share of Germany is 1.5%. So that's not very much, right? But it's much higher than our share of the global population. And then Germany has very, very ambitious uh, targets um, under the announced emissions reduction plans until 2050. And um, if we um, go by these targets with uh, about 85%, 90% reduction, which is very, very much, we still would have then 3% of the global emissions. So there has been out this number of 200 million migrants until 2050, which is extremely debatable, and it may well be double or not double, uh, depending on uh, how you actually define this migrant and um, who is located, being relocated permanently or temporarily. But if you just take this number, um, Germany would have a hypothetical responsibility towards 6 million migrants. So, of course, no one will enforce this responsibility, and these people are not moving to Germany, they're moving internally in Bangladesh or other places. However, if we talk about a, a sort of um, uh, principles for justice and the causation of environmental degradation and climate change, this is the responsibility that my country carries. And if you talk about the United States, uh, I think the share of global emissions currently is 15%. If we think that stays sort of the same until uh, 2050, um, that would mean, um, I think, uh, then 30, 30 million migrants, right? So it's a huge responsibility, even if um, the global share of emissions is, is quite low. So I would like to end with um, some images from the March of Science in Berlin and some thoughts on uh, science and uh, responsibility. So Pope Francis just gave a very good TED talk also. Um, and he said, how wonderful would it be if the growth of scientific and technological innovation would come along with more equality and social inclusion. So for us as scientists, um, we have the responsibility to find the truth, but once we found a piece of truth, we also have the responsibility to share it and to share these stories and to talk about them because they can be told. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to ask one question to get the discussion started, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, all of you touched on this to a degree, but you concluded by talking about the responsibility of scientists. And I think we're, my guest is largely in the room of scientists, not lawyers, which is the audience I'm used to speaking to. And I was wondering, um, in addition to scientists' responsibility to talk about the problem and the causality, all of which you, each of you did, to get a little more into um, the response and how scientists and a pub people with public health expertise can uh, help design a response to some of these climate change issues as they trickle down and deal in with conflicts and migration and so forth. So I know it's a big task, but if you were to start, sort of what would be the, the uh, places to start for public health experts? So. Uh, I'll take a stab. The, um, so many of these issues are public health issues. They're uh, just by the definition of the term. Um, and many of the responses that we will talk about are, are adaptive. There are preventative issues. There are reductions in emissions. There are many things that take many years. But we are really faced in a, a series of crises that will take um, uh, relatively rapid responses. And those many of those responses are public health responses. And that is um, assuring safe water systems, assuring safe food distribution, assuring access um, to areas where uh, people have need, um, access to communities and models for communities to, to establish um, patterns of resilience. Um, you know, there are great, actually, examples in Bangladesh and in the Philippines, for example, where they have recurrent disasters, and the actual mortality of those disasters have really shrunk because there's um, tremendous efforts towards 
of governance, uh, resilience, and an understanding of public health infrastructure. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's, there's so many dire things to talk about, but the fact is that there are um, really concrete, um, effective public health and governance solutions to encourage resilience in places that are, you know, suffer from recurrent disaster and even threats of drought. Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, this is on, you can hear? Yeah. Um, uh, perhaps if Gina McCarthy hadn't given her talk, I would have been less hesitant to say this, but I, I do believe that um, all of us in public health have to make it um, a high priority uh, to talk about climate change and to get this government and um, the major contributors to climate change and, and the talk about how German, Germany is preparing um, is illustrative, uh, that we have to control this. Um, the MENA projections for um, the MENA region, if we continue on the current emission rate, if we don't control it, um, even back to the mid-course projection, the MENA, the MENA estimates worst case, but we're looking more like worst case than the mid-course now in terms of trends, uh, would suggest that in the areas that um, were highlighted in the map, all of North Africa, most of the Mideast, there would be um, at least 200 days, 24-hour days a year where the day temperature does not go below 47 degrees centigrade and the night temperature does not go below 45 degrees centigrade. And the climate scientists are saying that density of heat will destroy agriculture and make it impossible for humans to live there. And that is the migration potential that we could see in this very populous region, which um, is also very laced with sectarian and communal conflict potential. So the, the numbers of people on our doorstep um, who, and you know this well, may not be university students, may be entire sectors of a miserable population, um, are ones we need to be thinking about. And, um, and we need to be thinking about it with the high urgency of averting that situation. We've got about uh, five to ten years. I mean, climate scientists in the room can put a finer um, spin on that. We don't have a lot of time to stop these enormous heat projections, let alone the water projections. Uh, so I think it, it's got to be taught in the schools. Um, it's got to be taught at high school level. Um, certainly at the higher junior um, grades, eighth and ninth graders, they're perfectly capable. Seventh graders are perfectly capable of understanding this. Uh, so that this is um, a really massive problem for the earth. And it is going to um, undermine human societies everywhere in various ways. So I believe that we have to be talking about climate change directly uh, in all of um, our various modes of work. Uh, I tend to work more on war and refugees and the migrations that come from it. Uh, so I see the... I see the darker side of what will happen, and I think about it more than perhaps some people do. But I think in the daylight and here with the resources we've got, uh, with the energy of um, leaders like Gina McCarthy and a number of people here at Harvard and elsewhere in this country, um, I think we have to get behind those that are arguing on this score. The other thing I would need to be doing um, as rich countries is preparing our citizens and our more recalcitrant um, homebodies to think about um, welcoming more people. We're a vast country. We have big obligations for taking in those who've been forced to flee home. And we need to be changing the dynamic in this country about our attitude towards foreigners, quote unquote. As peculiar, as odd as that sounds, since we all say we are all immigrants, except for African Americans who are forced to come. Um, and Native Americans who are here for millennia. Um, all the rest of us are immigrants. And, uh, and yet you know very well 
that we're quite hostile to the other in any number or any form. So to me, that is also part of public health. How do we manage social um, cohesion and tolerance of diversity? So I, I believe in, in addition to all the other things we're doing as scientists and as public health people, these are the two major civic obligations um, that we have to be about um, at this phase of our century. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is very complex and it's global, but we can also take it down, for instance, to the city level, because you also raised the issue of, of urban, urban rural areas. Um, especially with the city administrations, I've made the experience talking to town planners of such towns as uh, in Kulna, that um, they are really at the limit of their capacity. So Kulna has about 1.5 million people, and um, they have one town planner, and he has a staff of two, to administer the entire building of the city structures. So uh, building codes, uh, putting in drainage systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we asked him about cyclone preparedness and uh, health preparedness and all these things, and he said, well, um, when the cyclone hits, we don't have a plan. There is no manpower. So what he means, of course, of course, there are many people who are unemployed, and there's a lot of manpower, but there's no trained staff um, to help them do what they want to do. So all he's occupied with is right now putting a drainage system into the city, and that fills his entire schedule. So I think that in many cities, um, we should get health experts um, into the um, city administrations as advisory uh, persons um, to provide uh, insights on what can happen, uh, how, how can we avoid this, and we need to do it now. And how does it especially concern migrants? Because um, they're the most vulnerable when they come to, into a new place. But cities are also um, somehow hesitant to do that because they think as soon as they put in services, especially for the migrants, they will attract more migrants and they don't want them to come. So this again goes into the notion of um, uh, being more welcoming and pushing your city administration to be more welcoming and to give these services so that the people who arrive um, can live a successful life um, in, in these places of arrival. Great, thank you. So is there anyone in the audience who has a question uh, over there? I think there's microphones coming. Maybe we'll take a couple questions and then turn it over to the panel. Uh, Bonnie, this is in part response to your acknowledging that there are fewer lawyers than scientists here. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, 20 days ago, the General Assembly, the United Nations adopted the modalities for the negotiation of the Global Compact for Safe, Regular, and Orderly Migration. So my question is, with this response to the adoption last September of the New York Declaration, uh, that essentially seeks to address the consequences of the situation that, that uh, Mike and Jennifer referred to, um, there is an opportunity here to recast the whole understanding of uh, migration. And uh, so the question is really, what are the uh, likelihood of this being responsive to the crisis that you've described? And secondly, what critical issues would you want to see included in the Global Compact for Safe, Regular, and Orderly Migration that is supposed to be adopted uh, in September of 2018? Okay, a couple more questions in the back row, sir. Thanks very much. I'd like to sort of follow up on the last exchange there. And um, at the risk of being somewhat provocative, I want to sort of um, ask the panelists, I can see from your presentations uh, a very compelling argument as public health professionals and as citizens to really uh, work on, emphasize uh, the impact of, the negative impacts of climate change on health. What I'm not finding so compelling is how as public health professionals we should think about acting on climate change as an intervention to address the crises that you are describing. It seems to me that there are many things that are more urgent and are likely to be more effective in mitigating the negative effects of some of the things you're talking about than devoting a, a lot of attention or a lot of energy as public health activists on climate change itself 
And I wonder if you would talk about that contradiction. I'll take one more, and then uh, was there one in the back row, sir? Uh, thank you. Uh, Gina McCarthy talked very eloquently about the political um, uh, agenda of those of us individually uh, working on the climate change issue. I'd like you to speak about the responsibility of the university. Uh, that is, what role or responsibility does a university like Harvard have? Uh, there have been issues that have been brought forward about divestment in certain energy types of com uh, companies and so on. Is this uh, a way that the university, other than having courses here and courses there, and workshops here and workshops there, but as an institution, uh, do you think that universities should take a more uh, proactive position in this issue? That's an easy one. <laughs> Um, well, at least it's not aimed directly at you. Well, I know, that's right. Um, I'll, I, maybe I'll take a stab at um, um, Peter's first, maybe, and that is that the, I, I don't think it should be either, or I think we get stuck in academics writing papers, and I think we get stuck getting grants, and we do, that's the coin of the realm is actually what happens in publications for promotion and all of that stuff, and I think we're actually really not good, I'm not good, at changing that dynamic so it translates into public pressure, changing it into policy, affecting and engaging in policymakers. So, you know, as I heard the prior talk as well, I thought the first thing I thought is, I need lessons, man. I need lessons in um, how to engage in government and, and, and sort of government pressure policy because I feel passionate about it, just like we all do, um, and I don't think we know how to act well. Uh, act appropriately, well, act effectively. So, um, but what I, uh, I agree with you in that my stance is generally reactive, right? It's to look at resilient strategies. It's coming, we know it's coming. We, you know, the issues around, you know, whether it's a five-year window for reversal, a 10-year or a 50-year window for reversal is, you know, at issue, but we know it's coming. And so I, I think from my end, I'd, I prefer to address issues of resilience and adaptation and concrete solutions for the inevitable. Um, I, I don't think it pro prohibits us or uh, is in conflict with us from, from actually speaking out against those larger issues and those drivers, um, I would say. And, and I'll just make a little comment about the, um, Richard's comment about the role of Harvard because I think that we are at this really interesting crisis period of the validity of science, and that at some point we are gonna have to step forward and say unpopular things. You know, the university by definition is gonna be conflicted because we're funded by a lot of federal dollars, for example, and those federal dollars could be pulled if we say the wrong thing. I don't know if that's really a, a risk, but it feels like a risk. And, um, and I think at some point, the the thing we have to do is stand up for the validity and the voice of science and the, the importance of it. And there is no more important university in this country to do it, I think. Uh, I, I don't know how, and I suspect it's above my pay grade to make a strategy toward doing that, but I think it's important. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the treaty, um, the UN Treaty on Safe, um, uh, migration. I, um, I mean, it's guiding principles. It's not a treaty. Uh, um, I think it's, it's reasonable. It's sound. Parts of it um, are courageous. Um, we're, if we're in a world where facts don't matter within the United States, we're in a world where treaties don't matter for the international community, let alone guiding principles or normative statements. Uh, so. Um, this is um, the people who care and the wise people who hope that things will get better. That's what this treaty is about. That this 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 um, doc, yeah, this compact is about. Um, uh, I'm not ultimately cynical, but I am really pessimistic that it's going to make much of a difference. <laughs> um, and that I say that with regret, because it shows that some people are thinking quite appropriately about what some of the problems are, but the root causes are not really being addressed. The misery along the way is being addressed, and I think that's important and there should be effort to implement. Um, I, 
but as you know, a deck chair is on the Titanic question, um, which you know well. Um, in terms of the Peter's point, you slipped into saying, but what can public health activists do? How, what can we as public health activists do? Actually, we are public health researchers and teachers, aren't we? And if we're going to be public health activists, that's what we have to be in terms of talking about climate change and being out there in the hustings. And I think Mike said it very well. We're not particularly well trained to do that. And we need to be about the business of getting better at it. Um, I spent a large share of my avocational life being a leader in Physicians for Social Responsibility. I was all over the country talking about what would happen if a nuclear weapon exploded over one city or another. You know, I did the... I did the research showing that civil defense was totally ineffective, which is Reagan's policy. Uh, I was, it was, I was um, a lot younger, and um, I don't know what else was different, but I'm going to have to activate those muscle groups again, and, uh, because it is now necessary. Now, I don't know where venues to go to, who is going to organize us, where this is going to be going. PSR is actually starting a whole campaign on climate change. Uh, so I share Mike's sense of we're eagerness to get mobilized. I've done some of this before, but um, you're right. We are not at the moment um, engaged in the way we need to be. Uh, and uh, on the um, university's question, I also agree with Mike. I do believe that um, Drew and other leaders of the university here at Harvard are doing extraordinary work within universities around the country and also in Washington, trying to maintain uh, standards of facts and protect uh, whatever federal money is likely to come or could come to the universities in general, not just to Harvard. Uh, in terms of more activist stance, I think the situation's pretty fluid right now. Um, I mean, you heard Gina McCarthy say the business community is actually really trying to get involved and be ahead of the curve from a market perspective. Um, we need to know um, more about who we are aiding and abetting in terms of our investment policy and who actually is basically on our side. And uh, so I am not going to second guess a divestment policy, but I do think that at the, the forefront of what a university can actively argue about without taking activism classes is um, to protect the truth and to protect the search for evidence. Um, yeah, I would also like to comment on the question on uh, divestment, and this not only goes for the university, but also for private persons in investing. So the question is whether to invest in the destruction of the planet or in the protection of creation, I think the answer is clear what we should invest in. Um, and this ties into um, the other question that was asked about should we not focus on public health or should we not focus on poverty eradication, maybe more pressing issues for certain groups here. Um, if we um, do not protect uh, the planet um, and if we do not protect the advancements uh, of human civilization that have um, been able to uh, uh, yeah, develop because of a stable climate, then many of these advancements in public health, in poverty eradication, will be undone. So the research here will be done in vain. <laughs> so no one wants that. So um, yes, I think it's important uh, to take a clear stance on that. Thanks. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, right there. I just wanted to address the last point about the fact that it's not just a matter of divesting from fossil fuels, but it's what do you do instead to invest in. And clearly there's opportunities for more investment in clean energy, but also clean jobs, um, in helping uh, build community resilience. Um, and it's not just by getting universities to divest, but it's also our personal divestment, uh, divestment of holdings in our in the mutual funds that make up our uh, retirement plans, et cetera. You know, um, the thing that's I find just truly amazing is that so many of the funds that are offered here at Harvard, for example, still are investing in gambling, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, the so-called sin stocks. 
let alone fossil fuels. So there's really lots of opportunities for aligning the way we all invest with what we believe in. And it's a good way to send a signal to businesses about who we're going to support. Well, thank you. Another, any other questions? Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, with all your interest in Syria, uh, are there opportunities? I think there's a microphone behind you. With uh, Jennifer, with all the, uh, with Syria specifically, is there an opportunity to do things underground there to build, you know, things like the big Apple solar kind of building on this property? I mean, what are some of the resources there that we can uh, use to help people stay in Syria if they would like to stay in Syria? Great. And I see a question right in the row in front. We'll more of a response to Peter. Uh, why should we be concerned about health in the climate debate? And um, I quote just two of uh, the eminent keynote speech, uh, speakers. Gina said, Obama said, that climate change is a health issue. And she was so convinced, and that's right. And uh, Michelle Obama said, health is the face, the human face of climate change. So you need we need to improve as academicians, and here we come to the role of Harvard, the evidence base and communicate it to policy and to our citizens what the health implications are and to which limited extent we can protect the population, the health of the population. Because the health is the driving motive and not the, unfortunately, the saving of the creation and not economic uh, arguments. It's health. So on us is a large burden to produce the evidence and to communicate the evidence. Unfortunately, Gina rightly said also, health is the last to come to the table. So we have a catch up to do, and this is why I think uh, I congratulate Harvard to have put such, an F, uh, such a stress on this issue, Harvard Week and all the other activities. So I think uh, this is a very uh, appropriate uh, accent on health in climate change. Thank you. I'll take one final question and then turn it over to the panel um, in the back row there. Hi, I'm Greg Beyer, I'm an impact investor. What thoughts do you all have about the um, planning to make the availability of medicine, both the production and distribution, uh, to deal with, you know, as climate changes, um, supply chains break down, et cetera? Great, thanks. Um, so any uh, responses or final words? I think Syria. The question on Syria is um, very interesting. Um, at the moment, um, what we need to do is give funds to the major humanitarian organizations in the UN who are trying to prop up populations all up and down um, the Mideast and the chain into Europe. Um, I would say to citizens we should be um, speaking in parallel ways to whoever we sit with on the subway about the need to, for us to bring in more refugees um, from Syria. Uh, it's unclear when the act of fighting is going to stop. There's a putative ceasefire that is not holding, even in the areas it was um, designed for. And there are ongoing um, acute clashes now, uh, some in the south, still in Raqqa area, and it's um, it's a, and the Idlib area is, is in high jeopardy. Uh, so that this is the context in which it's very difficult to think about people going home, going back, um, let alone how could we work to mitigate um, climate change issues within Syria. But let's say um, that in some near term uncertain, there is a ceasefire. And let's say that maybe half of the people who are now outside of Syria want to return. The longer this war goes on, we know the less likely refugees are to come back. But let's say about half want to come back, and they come back um, wounded and, and marred by their experiences to face rubble, really a lot of rubble. Um, then there is going to be a gargantuan effort of cleanup for which there will need to be energy sources and investment. 
Uh, we're really talking about on a smaller scale, but it's the extent intensity of devastation is sort of World War II cities and environment um, rebuilding. So there will need to be a Marshall Plan. It, it is all so expensive in, term, in terms of human blood and treasure, what we have got ourselves into here with Syria. So expensive. Um, we're going to need a Marshall Plan to shore people up. And we are then also, this again, whatever the settlement is, assumes there is going to be some modicum of good governance that is permitted. So that's a big assumption. But if that is the case, then there will be um, a grave urgency to figure out what are more appropriate ways to craft livelihoods in this country, that is Syria, which is going to be whatever we do to mitigate the arc of carbon emissions, it's going to be stressed over the next 20 to 50 years because of what is already baked into the climate. Uh, and, um, and so then I think it's going to be very imaginative. What are we are learning in terms of, say, the extraordinary things that Germany is doing in terms of clean energy and, and, um, and housing and water use? Um, there will be translatable things for Syria. And it may well be a source of a positive, virtuous cycle of economic rebuilding. Um, I, I believe that people going back are going to be eager once they get over the dismay of what they see. They're going to be eager to rebuild both politically and socially, but also economically differently. And that is going to be an opportunity. And I, for all of the discouragement I feel in the short run, having interacted with a large number now of Syrian refugees, and for people and people who are still thinking about what they're going to do next with Syria, I think it's going to be a very active and imaginative uh, workforce and um, elite that um, we could think about investing in at a Marshall Plan level. So I'm glad you asked that question. There's a, a very big and um, time uncertain hiatus between now and the time you're talking about, but. It is actually time now for us to be investing and thinking about how we're going to invest. Uh, because Syria, Syria is Mesopotamia. You know, even with all the damage, it's still the heartland of Western and in some ways, you know, Mideastern and North African civilization. So it's, it's, it's core to us. Um, yeah, I just want to make some remarks on the question on um, distributing, making medicine more accessible. I think it's just one of uh, many measures that need to be taken. Um, and another one is capacity building, of course. And I think we, we do not yet realize how big the measures are going to be in order to avoid the climate and migration crisis. And you just talked about a Marshall Plan, that also notion of big uh, financial and uh, capacity building um, uh, necessities. Um, so when we think about the reasons for migration and how to um, yeah, limit them and, and fight them, uh, then we should also think about the fact that with climate change and with the structure of the global economic system, that we are also the reasons for this migration. Okay, well thank you, and thank, please give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, that was, that was really terrific and sobering, but I think also areas of hope, and I like the finishing with the Marshall Plan. Uh, notion. I just want to very quickly say, I mean, I think in terms of what universities can do, um, I actually think Harvard, and I'm first to criticize Harvard when I think we're not doing enough on stuff. And I will say as a public health community, I think not just Harvard, but, but all of us across the globe have not done enough around climate change. But on, on the issue of climate change, I think Harvard has done a lot. And I understand that there's a controversy about divestment. Uh, but if you go beyond that and look at substantively where the university has made its investments, how it has really thought about tackling uh, carbon, its carbon footprint. I brought this up a little bit earlier, but also encouraging all of us to kind of engage much more broadly. Um, I think uh, this university has really taken the lead. Um, we should be, we can and should do more, and we should help our brethren, other universities also engage in this more. Um, so thank you all for, for sitting through that panel. Let's one more round of applause for the panel.